One of the guideposts for living that we have in the theosophical literature is, of course, the voice of the silence. And I frequently say to my friends, I think Shakespeare would be jealous of some of the poetry in that lovely, lovely book. If you haven't familiarized yourself with it, you have missed a great treasure. It's a kind of book that stimulates the intuition. Now, I mean intuition in the theosophical sense of getting insights. It's a book that one does not read from cover to cover and put down as a mystery, though it is a mystery. It is a book you come back to again and again and find that bit by bit you've understood more because you've changed. The book hasn't. You have. We have. Now, she dedicated that book to the few. Why to the few? I think one need only look at the first few verses to discover almost at once the reason. Practically straight off, she says, we must become indifferent to the objects of perception and seek out the thought producer. What a task. The very first. Few would think it possible. Few would attempt it. Even fewer when they understand that to do this, there are dangers, hardships, and enormous self-sacrifice in front of us. Who would want to do it? Surely only the few. Now, in a short piece that has been entitled, There is a Road, H.P. Blavatsky mentions a secret gateway. This little piece is also a guidepost for living. Very short, very succinct. It reads, there is a road, steep and thorny, beset with perils of every kind, but yet a road. And it leads to the very heart of the universe. I can tell you how to find those who will show you the secret gateway that opens inwardly only and closes fast behind the neophyte forevermore. There is no danger that dauntless courage cannot conquer. There is no trial that spotless purity cannot pass through. There is no difficulty that strong intellect cannot surmount. For those who win onward, there is reward past telling, the power to bless and save humanity. For those who fail, there are other lives in which success may come. How beautiful. She tells it like it is. It's not going to be a rose garden but you can do it. Where's that road? Why is the gateway secret? Why does it open to a steep and thorny road? Obviously, the road is a metaphor for life. And the steep and thorny road is a metaphor for a specific way of life. The gateway that leads to this particular life, this way of life, opens inwardly only, and once we pass through, it closes fast forevermore. Now, clearly, we're talking about our subjective nature, aren't we? Inwardly. The subjective side of ourselves, not the physical body. Our thoughts, our feelings, our desires, our hopes, our aspirations are all part of the subjective nature, but much, much more. Beyond all that, the inner self. The enduring self. The true self. The one 
self. But what is self? Who do we think we are? Let me tell you about a man who had that problem. There had been a great many delays on flights, and, United, and a United Airlines agent at the gate was working furiously to try to rebook people and see how many could get on a flight. And a man dressed in a very fancy business suit pushed his way to the head of the line and said to the agent, I absolutely must be on this flight. And she said to him, I'm sorry, sir, but you're going to have to wait in line, like everyone else. And he became quite angry and said, do you know who I am? And she took the night, Mike, tapped it and said, excuse me, I have a gentleman here at gate number 36 who has lost his identity. <laughs> if anyone help, can help him to find it, would they please report to United Gate 36? <laughs> so what is self? Who are we? I don't think many people ever stop to consider that. I don't think, if you'll pardon me, many of us theosophists ever stop to think about it. Oh, we can repeat all the words. That's not hard. But to really find out isn't so easy, perhaps. As you well know, many people identify with their physical bodies, mostly. I don't think anyone does 100%. Or they identify with their emotional nature, their mental nature, their thoughts, their view about life. Finally, they really identify with what they call me, which is a process, isn't it? A sort of a habitual way of thinking and feeling, and that becomes me, doesn't it? Now, if the gate that HPV talks about opens inwardly is simply a gate to our self-image, just to that part of us. It's certainly not secret, at least not to us. We may have one idea about it and our friends may have a totally different idea, of course. Moreover, the gate doesn't close fast behind us forevermore, does it? We can revise that self-image. We can say, I was born a Jew, a Christian, a Hindu, whatever else. Now I'm an atheist. We can say I used to be a theosophist, but I got so sick of it, I quit and joined a munitions factory. <laughs> Can't we? We can improve our self-image. Nice idea. Very useful, perhaps, in many ways. But the gate doesn't close fast behind forevermore if we're talking about the self-image. I suggest to you that the gate that closes permanently behind us is not a gate to self-analysis. It is not a gate to new ideas and theories about who we are, even the theosophical ones. However important those theories are, we heard this morning about a useful hypothesis. Of course we need useful hypotheses. Of course. But they're not the reality, are they? The gate that opens inwardly is one that opens, from my point of view, to a totally new state of consciousness, to the very first awakening of that inner self. It is qualitatively different from our usual state of consciousness, which is important and not to be denigrated. That experience is qualitatively different. It is an impersonal state in which there is no longer a sense of self and other, no longer duality, but only the eternal. In the voice of the silence, we read, 
When waxing stronger, thy soul glides forth from her secure retreat and breaking loose from the protecting shrine, extends her silver thread and rushes onward. When beholding her image on the waves of space, she whispers, this is I. Declare, O disciple, that thy soul is caught in the webs of delusion. The gateway is secret because until experienced, it is totally unknown. Until we experience that inner self, it is but theory, isn't it? So it's a secret gateway, not because someone is hiding it from us, but because it's unknown until experienced. And when we do, as millions have, all of our theories and beliefs become, as St. Thomas Aquinas said, a heap of straw when the divine consciousness awakens within us. When that inner self is experienced, when for a fleeting forever we are that self, there is no time. There is no self. There is only eternity. Once that reality flashes on our mind, the gate closes fast forevermore and we can never forget it. Now most of us know that it is likely that when we die we get a flash of the life just lived and the near-death experiences report that, don't they? Not many people know that H.P. Blavatsky said when we are born we get a flash of the life to come. And no doubt, that's why we cry. <laughs> in that flash, it is said, we get a view of the work to be done in that life, the work that we have accepted to try at a very deep level, to work out, to try to work out. There's no guarantee of success anywhere. But we've accepted a certain task a dharma, as they say in, in Sanskrit. And the individuality gets a flash of that, as is said, at birth, and then tries to work it out through the life. Now, that flash is not the goal, it's not the life, is it? When we first experience that what the Zen master called, and which I absolutely love because I think it's so accurate, that fleeting forever, of the inner self, we have not reached the goal. We haven't finished our work any more than that infant has finished its life. It's the beginning, not the end. <laughs> it's the point where we start to work. HPB sort of alludes to something like that in uh, something she writes on meditation. She says, in his hours of silent meditation, the student will find that there is one space of silence within him where he can find refuge from the thoughts and desires, from the turmoil of the senses and the delusions of the mind. By sinking his consciousness deep into his heart, he can reach this place. At first only in silence and, in, and darkness, but when the need for the silence has grown great enough, he will turn to seek it, even in the midst of struggle with self, and he will find it. Only he must not let go of his outer self or his body. He must learn to retire into this citadel when the battle grows fierce but to do so without losing sight of the battle. No wonder it takes so long. Without allowing himself to fancy that by so doing he has won the victory, 
that victory is won only when all is silence without, as within the inner citadel. Fighting thus from within that silence, the student will find he has solved the first great paradox. No, we have not reached the heart of the universe when that first flash occurs. Rather, we have seen that ahead of us lies a steep and thorny road. But remember, there's a solution to every problem. Why is it steep and thorny? Why is it beset with perils? What are the perils? Once awakened, that inner self must learn to gain mastery over the whole nature. It must reign in the mind, purify it, sharpen it, direct it in ways that are totally new to it, make it so crystal clear that it will carry out the will of that inner reality, which we ultimately are. We must overcome all the challenges that we meet. We must destroy what K.H. called the living wall our own ego, the sense of me, that which we think we are, which is said to be illusory, but with which we are so identified, and let's not kid ourselves, we are, that any threat to it is painful, psychological or otherwise. Our enemies are often our best friends. They punch holes in the ego all the time. It hurts, but we might be grateful to them in the long run for it. They used to say about Dora Kunz out here, she was the best ego smasher ever. <laughs> she was indeed. It's a gigantic task that's set before us, but not to be discouraged. It just takes effort and time. Lots of effort, and lots of time, but it can be done. Why is it such a gigantic task? Because our habitual way of thinking and acting has built up a powerful momentum. Inertia is a fact, right straight through the system, from the subtlest states to the most dense physical states. Inertia is a fact. It's an emotional state, a mental state, everything else, isn't it? If you stop and think about it. We can't change instantly a way of life that has been going on for at least 40, 50 years. Moreover, it may have been going on for many incarnations back if you accept reincarnation. How can we expect that with a little bit of effort we can change the whole thing and become enlightened? That's why I get so tired of some of the uh, modern alleged spiritual literature that says you can say your affirmation in the morning and become the Buddha in the afternoon. Well, it doesn't work that way, does it? Isn't it? You know, HPB said the most important quality of the spiritual life was common sense. It just doesn't make any common sense at all to think you could do that, does it? But people want to believe it, so they pay a fortune to buy methods to become the Buddha in the afternoon. Or if they don't like the Buddha, they pick somebody else. Now, K.H. was commenting on this. He didn't use the word inertia, but he surely meant that. And he wrote, the process of self-purification is not the work of a moment, nor of a few months, but of years, nay, extending over a series of lives. The later a man begins living the higher life, the longer must be his period of probation. Here's the inertia part. For he must undo the effects of long number of years spent in objects diametrically opposed to the real goal. All right, where do we begin then if we want to make some effort toward all this? If we think maybe there's some truth to this and we really want to start. If we haven't already, I'm sure most of us have already started. I have no doubt of it, matter of fact, or you wouldn't be sitting here listening to this. HPB says we start by admitting ignorance. 
There's the first little bit of pain. <laughs> Someone once said, the trouble with the world is the ignorant know-it-all and the intelligent doubt. She wrote this, the first necessity for obtaining self-knowledge is to become profoundly conscious of ignorance, to feel with every fiber of the heart that one is ceaselessly self-deceived. The second requisite is the still deeper conviction that such knowledge, such intuitive and certain knowledge, can be obtained by effort. There's always the hope, you see. It's not a doomsday message. Ultimately, theosophy is optimistic. But in the short run, it's a steep and thorny road. The third and most important is an indomitable determination to obtain and face that knowledge. Self-knowledge of this kind is obtainable by, is, of this kind is unattainable by what men usually call self-analysis. It is not reached by reasoning or any brain process for it is the awakening to consciousness of the divine nature of man. That indomitable determination is that, that inexpressible longing for the infinite. What are we to do? Well, we have guidelines, don't we? We have guideposts, as the word has been used for this week's programs. One of them is at the feet of the master. It lists four qualities. Discrimination, perhaps better put, discernment. To learn to see accurately instead of through our expectations, through our conditioning. We have, all of us have had this experience. We ha all of us have friends, I hope, and family. Inevitably, those who are closest to us are the ones that hurt us occasionally, aren't they? Not intentionally, usually. What happens? Say it's a friend, even at the office. They do something that hurts our feelings. Do we see them the next time we meet them, or do we see our memory of what they did to us? Do you see that? We see the memory, don't we? If we can wipe that out and see the person as they are, in fact, see beyond what they appear to be, then maybe we're beginning to see a little more clearly and maybe having a little more discernment. We need to discern the good, in Plato's sense especially, of the eternal from the transitory. Discern what really matters from what doesn't matter more than two prunes. Not easy, is it? Worth doing. Very worth doing. Desirelessness, I think one of the most misunderstood qualities from my point of view. We all can have our own point of view, but I have the mic now, so I'll give you mine. <laughs> <clears throat> without personal motive, without coming back to self, like the arrows suggest, hooking back to ourselves. It, it isn't that we can't do things we like to do. If we enjoy dancing or singing or if we enjoy playing chess or whatever it is we enjoy doing, by all means do it. There should be joy in life. We shouldn't go around with long faces all the time, creating beds of nails to lie on. Life will provi provide all that. You don't have to make any up. So have some joy. Uh, but if what I want blocks doing what is right, that has to go. Do the right for its own sake, not for reward.
than good conduct. If nothing else, certainly a standard ethical life. All these things have profound implications, but we'll deal with them later in the week, I believe. And the last, love. I have said many times from this and other platforms, quoted many times, what Mrs. Besant said, because I think she defined love in a way that was exquisite, and I have never heard a better definition. She said, love is the response that comes from a realization of oneness. It is that inevitable consequence of a realization of unity and outpours what we call love to an animal even, to a child, to a friend, to a great spiritual light. In that case, it's often called devotion. You might not believe it, but I have a powerful devotional streak in me, as many others do. Now there's a second guidepost, and that's called the Golden Stairs. HPB says that her teacher, Moria, gave it to her and said, give this to those you teach. In an ever so slightly abbreviated version, it reads, a clean life, an open mind, a pure heart, an eager intellect, an unveiled spiritual perception, a brotherliness for one's co-disciple, a readiness to give and receive advice and instruction, and then I think the hardest of all, a courageous endurance of personal injustice, and poor HPB didn't do too well with that one herself. <laughs> A brave declaration of principles, a valiant defense of those who are unjustly attacked, and a constant ideal to the human progression and perfection which the sacred science depicts, these are the golden stairs up the steps of which the learner may climb to the temple of divine wisdom. You can spend weeks, years, meditating on these stairs. I did something with that in Dallas recently. And I asked each of them to think quietly first, not to blurt out anything, but to ponder one step at a time. We started with a clean life, and we, I asked for silence for at least 15 seconds. Hard for Americans, but we managed. Because I think that by doing that sometimes you get a deeper insight into things. All sorts of things came up. At the end of which I said, it isn't so simple as it looks, is it? Look how many different things you came up with for a clean life. Right down to not taking drugs and polluting the body with poor food and things like that. Everything from that to moral and ethical states. An open mind, being willing. I always say the, all of us are willing to question somebody else's ideas, as long as you don't question mine. An open mind isn't just being willing to hear somebody else's ideas, it's being willing to look at your own ideas and say, perhaps I've got it wrong. That wonderful quote that John Alger and I both love that uh, was said by uh, Milton to Cromwell, one of the beasts in English history, Philistine, who drove his horses into the cathedral at... Uh, uh, oh, what, what was that cathedral? Now I've forgotten. It was, used to be the capital of, uh, you would know in the back, wouldn't you? The cathedral down in uh, southern England uh, that was... Are you Canterbury? No, it wasn't Canterbury, but in any case, it doesn't matter. He drove his horses into the cathedral in the middle of the night because he was a Republican. He, wanted, he, he wasn't a royalist and he didn't go for the, what the church was doing. And he smashed all the statues and the altar and everything else. It was dreadful what he did. 
In any case, Milton looked at him and his colleagues once and said, Gentlemen, gentlemen, I beseech you from the bowels of Christ, I beseech you, consider you may be mistaken. <laughs> Wonderful quote. I say it to myself frequently. <laughs> but you see, it's not just enough to have an open mind. We have to have an eager intellect. We have to seek for it, don't we? We have to search, search, search. Courageous endurance of personal injustice, but not a wimp. Brave declaration of principles. Right behind the courageous endurance of personal injustice. And a valiant defense of those unjustly attacked. And it goes on. Now there is another guidepost. One that has been called the three limbs of the theosophical life. I have yet to find anybody who knows for sure where that started. Perhaps Radha can tell us if she knows later. But uh, to date, no one seems to be able to put their finger on exactly where that came from. Anyhow, I think it's valid. Whoever said it, it doesn't matter who said it. There's nothing new under the sun, as the prophet in the Old Testament said. And he was quite right. Only new ways of phrasing it. Those three limbs are study. Now, that's the first. For years, I thought study was one thing, meditation was another, service was another. I have a very different view now, I shall tell you in a minute. And for years, I thought study was reading the books. That's a good idea. I recommend it. It's a good idea to listen to people you think may have some understanding of these things. Very good. Helpful, perhaps. But that's not study to me. Study is something I think I've done sort of instinctively from my early years in the Theosophical Society. I joined in 1959. You take an idea that sort of you feel there's something to it. You don't quite maybe understand the whole thing, but it sort of prods the back of your mind, if I can put it that way. And you ponder it. You come back to it. You don't immediately decide what it means. You don't just memorize it and repeat it. I probably have told this story before, but we had a member in the NYTS, the only one I know in my history since 1959, we ever had to put on probation. The bylaws provided for that. And we finally had to. I won't go into the details of why, but it truly was necessary because we wouldn't have had a New York Theosophical Society if that woman remained. But anyway, we put her on probation and gave her a chance to redeem herself. And she would sit at any Theosophical lecture no matter who was speaking, I'm sure she would have done the same for Radha. It wouldn't have bothered her at all that Radha was international president. And whatever they said, she would say, you said, but theosophy clearly teaches. <laughs> well, I was giving a talk one time. I have no idea what it was now. And she was in the audience, and I knew what was coming. And when I finished, she started with her Recording. <clears throat> you said, but theosophy clearly teaches. And I let her finish it. And I said, oh, Lillian, if it were a matter of the words, a tape recorder would be an enlightened being. It's not a matter of the words. So study to me is not learning the words and the concepts and repeating them. It's important to look at the concepts. It's important to look at the theories. It's important to study and accept maybe certain hypotheses that are reasonable to us. But know the difference, as was said this morning, between knowing it for yourself, internalizing it for yourself, and holding it as a reasonable hypothesis. There's a vast difference though the former may lead to the latter. The hypothesis may lead to the experience. 
It points us in the right direction, maybe. Then meditation is the second limb. You know meditation is also a study? And do you know that both the study that I have mentioned and the way I've talked about it and meditation go beyond the ego? It's not the ego that meditates. If it is, it's a worthless piece of effort. The ego isn't the solution, it's the problem. It has to be let go. Not easy. The adept said once, if adept ship were easy, it would be worthless. How true. Of anything that's worthwhile, isn't that so? The great Olympic athletes. Is it easy? No. Is it worth it? Yes. Meditation is an inward search, isn't it? Beyond ego. And then we have service. I used to think that was different from the other two. Service to me is not deciding that I shall go out and help the Theosophical Society or volunteer at the hospital. Wonderful idea, I hope you do. Useful. Good. Service to me is a way of life. And it derives from the other two. When we study in this way I've suggested and begin to understand, when we meditate and begin to access more, to be aware more of the influence of that inner nature, the inevitable conquest, the inevitable consequence is service. We have to do it where we can and to know where we can't. In big cities, we cannot take in all of the homeless people. It is absurd to think we can. Someone once said, if you cannot do a work, it's not your work. And we must be strong enough to accept that. But where we can help, we can do no other. Just a very simple little example personal example, which is kind of amusing. I may have mentioned it here once before. There's a pizza place near us that I go to often when I'm on the way to the TS. I just have to walk one block out of the way, and I get my slice of pizza, and I go to the TS for the meeting. And there's a jolly, uh, I wouldn't say very educated, but a nice fellow who runs it. <clears throat> and uh, he's very friendly. And uh, typical New York, we talked to each other for years before we introduced each ourselves. <laughs> but now we're on a first name basis. Well, I walked in one day and he was sitting at one of the tables. That I, when I go in the evening, there aren't many people there. At lunchtime, forget it. I mean, it's round the block line. The pizza is so good there. Um, anyway, I went in and he was sitting at the back table and he had his head down sort of. He looked really like miserable. And I walked over to him and I said, are you sick or are you just tired? He said, I'm tired. I said, sit up. I can't stand to see anybody suffer. <laughs> and I gave him a therapeutic touch treatment. And he was so impressed with the therapeutic touch that he said, do him. He's tired. <laughs> I mean, isn't that, it wasn't, I didn't do anything big. And anything, I didn't go out and save humanity. Don't you all do things like this? I'm not touting myself. I'm just, that's just an example that occurred to me. I couldn't, I couldn't let him sit there and feel miserable if I could do something to help him. Didn't cost me much, see? It's that kind of thing. Where you can help, you can do no other. You will. Now, who can lead us to this sacred gate, secret gateway? I think ultimately it's our own innermost nature that leads us what HPV calls the divine nature within. That innermost nature, theoretically, and I think with some evidence for it, shines through every human being. 
There's a collect in the liberal Catholic Church that ends the collects for every Mass. And it reads, Teach us, O Lord, to see thy life in all men and in all the peoples of thine earth, and so guide the nations into the understanding of thy laws, that peace and goodwill may reign upon earth through Christ our Lord. Isn't that a beautiful sentiment? To see that divine life in every creature. Most people don't see. I notice in New York, I notice in myself, but I've tried to watch it and be aware, people don't see. Especially the people who live there, the tourists see up at the buildings. But I bet a lot of them don't see some little details on the buildings. I found one on our own street that I hadn't seen just recently. That's how unobservant I was. We don't see. And to see that divine life shining through every other human being is not easy, especially when we find them very difficult people. But it's there. And you can help bring it out. Sometimes with just a smile. We have a very cantankerous woman in our building. She's a woman after my own heart because she's a curmudgeon and so am I. And she sometimes makes really very caustic remarks. They're very funny sometimes. We recently redid the lobby. <clears throat> it's gorgeous, according to everybody in the building. Well, not gorgeous, that's the wrong word, but everybody's pleased with it. It looks nice. It's a small lobby. We have huge apartments. We have, most of them are about 2,000 square feet and 11-foot ceilings, so that's really divine in New York City. But the lobby is rather small. And it was well done, and there are little fancy lights hanging down. Well, I, even I think they have a few too many. I think they have 10. And I was in the lobby with her one day, and she said, I don't know why we have to have 10 lights in a room the size of a broom closet. <laughs> <laughs> so she's really quick. <laughs> and sometimes when I get one of these caustic remarks that I have on the, that comes over the internet or something, and I see her in the hallway, I say, I've got one you're going to love. <laughs> and I tell her what the remark is, you know. Um, but it shines through every human being. However, in the, it shines feebly through most, not very bright. Why isn't it very bright? I suggest it's because of our ego, which is like clouds to the sun. Some egos are very dark indeed and very threatening. Others are lovely little fluffy white clouds. They still block the sun. Fluffy little white egos or dark threatening ones, they still block the sun. In some human beings, the rare human being, the holy ones, the rishis, the adepts, the saints. It sh that light shines brilliantly through a cloudless sky. And it illuminates and uplifts the whole world. So while it's true that it is our innermost self that ultimately shows us or leads us to the secret gateway, it is also true that the light shining through the adepts can influence us and inspire us to the good, the true, and the beautiful. The influence that they shed on the world is not personal. Very important, that. I never think for a moment that they're thinking of Ed. Why bother? And I don't think, except in the sense of devotion to their work, 
we should be thinking of them particularly in a personal way. I think if we deeply long to alleviate human suffering, if we really deeply want to relieve human suffering in all of its forms, if we're motivated by compassion and altruism, I believe, and it's even suggested by the Mahatma in one of the letters, we are automatically in the sphere of their influence. Not by calling on them personally, surely not by asking for personal help, but by trying to get in rapport with what they'd like done. I think they'd welcome that. They want co-workers, not worshipers. And if they want co-workers, they must believe we can help. Or they wouldn't say that. Moreover, we can and do contribute to that stream of influence. I'm convinced that you can contribute. Everyone can. By being, trying to be in rapport with what they want, by pouring out that compassion, I suspect they pick that up and use it more wisely than we would, no doubt. If we want to find the secret gateway, if we want to follow the, ro the road to reward past telling, we can. But we must be driven by compassion for all who suffer. We must have an, in the words of the adept, an iron, never failing determination. And yet, be gentle and humble. We must be clad in the armor of courage. We must take the shield of purity and wield the sword of intellect. If we do that, we will enter the sphere of influence that streams forth from the tireless efforts of the adepts then we can work with them impersonally for the good of humanity as a whole. Then we can know who we really are. Then we can be free. Thank you.